Hi, this is Chris Ebinger with Nightfall Audiobooks, and welcome to another Nightfall Audiobooks production. This is Ski Weekend by R.L. Stein. I have not read this before. I skimmed through the book in my usual fashion. I wrote down the voices that I think will work for these characters. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm at nightfallaudiobooks at gmail.com, or I'm on YouTube at Nightfall Audiobooks. Send me a comment, like, subscribe. Tell your friends, tell your mom, tell anybody that you think would like to listen to me read to them. So thank you very much for listening, and I will see you at the end of this book. Welcome to a Nightfall Audiobooks production. This is Ski Weekend by R.L. Stein, a Fear Street novel, book 10. Chapter 1 Doug, slow down, I cried, closing my eyes as we skidded over the icy road. Hey, I can handle it. Doug spun the wheel and somehow managed to straighten the car out before we slid off the road. Then, before we were even out of the skid, he stomped on the gas pedal and we roared forward again. Doug! I called from the back seat. He was laughing. He loved scaring us. He loved the danger of it. Mainly, he loved showing off. Ariel is right, Shannon said, sitting behind him in the old Plymouth, sounding frightened. You're going too fast. We know you can't see two feet in front of your face. Doug sped up in response. His dark eyes lit up with excitement, and he had a wide grin on his face. Tell him to go faster, I told Shannon. Then maybe he'll slow down. Why don't you let me drive for a while, Red said, leaning forward from the seat beside me. He'd been awfully quiet, I realized, ever since we left the ski lodge. I've driven in snow like this a lot. Hey, sit back and leave the driving to us, Doug said, laughing as if he just cracked a hilarious joke. He turned to Shannon. Stop grabbing my arm, will you? Do you want to have an accident? Doug, you're really scaring us, Shannon said angrily. She had her knees up against the glove compartment, her arms crossed tightly in front of her. You want to get home by tonight, don't you? Doug said, turning the wheel hard as the car went into another slide. Yeah, of course, Shannon said quietly. Her parents hadn't wanted her to go on the ski trip, but she had pleaded and begged and promised them everything would be fine, and they had finally agreed. She was desperate to get back before they really started to worry and get angry. Shannon's mom and dad didn't exactly approve of Doug, so she hadn't told them he was going on the trip. If they found out she'd sneaked away with him for a ski weekend, they'd approve of him even less. It sure is coming down, Red said, rubbing the steam off his window with a bare hand so he could see out. There wasn't much to see. It was snowing so hard the air was white. At least that's the way it looked to me, staring out through the smeared glass. It had been snowing lightly when we left the ski lodge, little wet flakes that didn't look like they'd amount to much. Then, as we curved down the mountain, the wind began to roar and gust, and the snow began to drop in what appeared to be solid waves of white. Doug's old Plymouth pitched forward, sliding on each twist in a narrow road. Every time the tire skidded, my heart jumped. A short while before we took off, a lot of cars had left the mountain on the narrow winding road down the mountain, but now ours seemed to be the only one in sight. The wipers made a loud scraping noise as they swept across the windshield. Ice was forming on the glass. I knew Doug couldn't see a thing, so why wouldn't he slow down? Because he was Doug. Because he loved being Mr. Macho, Mr. Dangerous. I'd known Doug for a long time. He was a really great friend. But that day was one day I wished Doug weren't Doug. It would have been so much nicer to have a sane person driving. Scraping across the glass, the windshield wipers did their best but the snow came down so fast the windshield was constantly blanketed. The wind howled at us, pushing the car roughly from side to side. My long, straight blonde hair had fallen out from under my wool cap. I tucked it back in, then scooted down in the seat and tried to see the late afternoon sky. No way. The falling snow was just too thick and heavy. It reminded me of a dumb joke of my dad's. He'd pick up a blank piece of paper and say, Ariel, do you like my drawing? What drawing? I'd always ask. It's a polar bear in a snowstorm, he'd say. Or, it's a snowman at the North Pole. I used to think it was pretty funny, but now that I was in a scene that looked a lot like that blank sheet of paper, it wasn't funny at all. The tires suddenly whirred beneath us. I uttered a quiet gasp. Chill out, Doug said. I guess my gasp wasn't as quiet as I thought. I can handle it. Can't you drive with two hands? Shannon pleaded. Hey, what for? I need one hand for you, Doug teased, reaching out with his right hand and squeezing Shannon's shoulder. Doug, please. You're going to kill us all. Shannon, give me a break, will you? The atmosphere in the car was really tense. 
partly because we were heading blindly down a mountain on a slick, twisting road with a madman at the wheel, and partly because Randy wasn't with us and everyone knew I was upset about that, and partly because we were sharing the car with a stranger, someone we'd only known for a couple of days. Don't get me wrong, we all liked Red right from the start, but it's hard not to feel uncomfortable with someone new around, especially in such a tense situation. I glanced over at Red, who was staring out his window, his forehead pressed against the glass. I don't believe this, he said quietly. Red was really nice, I have to admit. I mean, he'd been especially nice to me ever since we'd met a few days before at the ski lodge. And I thought he was kind of cute with his wavy red hair and intense dark eyes. But I wished it were my boyfriend, Randy, sitting there instead of this stranger, Randy. Just thinking about him made me angry again. On Thursday afternoon, Doug, Shannon, Randy, and I had driven all the way up to Pineview Lodge for a long weekend of skiing and fun, and mainly just to get away from Shadyside. Then Randy had to go and ruin it all. Thinking about it, I still didn't feel that the fight we had was my fault. I mean, we had planned this weekend for so long. What right did Randy have to suddenly insist we drive back early on Sunday so he wouldn't miss a stupid basketball game? If we went back early, we'd lose a whole day of skiing, Staying at Pineview was pretty expensive, and the rest of us wanted to stay and get our money's worth. Naturally, Doug and Shannon disappeared, leaving Randy and me at the little table in the crowded lounge to argue it out. I couldn't help it. The argument quickly became a screaming fight. People were staring at us, but I didn't care. I mean, Randy is always pulling some selfish stunt like that. I was determined that this one time I wasn't going to give in. When he said, Ariel, try to see it from my point of view. I just lost it. I guess I was shouting pretty loud, and that's when he jumped up, knocking his chair over with a loud clatter, and drawing gasps and cries of surprise from the four girls at the next table, and stomped out of the lounge. I'm not the stubborn one, I yelled after him. I knew he couldn't hear me, but I wanted to get the last word in. Then I realized that everyone was focused on me, and I felt really embarrassed. I just sat there staring down at that little table. I didn't get up or anything. I don't even remember what I was thinking. That was when Red had come over. Is there anything I can do? he asked. I glanced up at him suspiciously, trying to see if he was coming on to me. He wasn't. He looked so cute with that boyish face and all his freckles. He was genuinely trying to be nice. He sat down and we started talking. He told me he had grown up near these mountains, but he hadn't been back for a while. He tried to cheer me up, and I took an immediate liking to him. There are certain people like that, I think. People you meet and right away you know you're going to like them. So when Shannon and Doug came back, I introduced them to Red, and the four of us went into the restaurant to have dinner. Red hung out with us for the rest of the weekend. Randy had left a note at the front desk saying he was taking the bus back to Shadyside. The note made me so angry, I tore it into little pieces. I realized Randy probably thought he was a great guy, because he bothered to leave me a note. Well, I was determined to have a good time without him, and with Red around, having a good time wasn't so difficult. So when he said he needed a ride to Brockton, we were more than happy to help him out. But now, here we were just an hour from the ski lodge, nowhere near Brockton, in the worst snowstorm I'd ever been in, with at least another six hours in a car ahead of us, and I was really feeling bummed out knowing that Randy was home safe and sound, and probably not even worrying about me for one second. It's freezing in here, Shannon groaned, turning to look at me as she pulled the hood of her ski jacket up over her coppery hair. Shannon always looks kind of sad and pouty. That's her natural expression, but now she looks downright miserable. What can I do? Stop and buy a new car? The heater's busted, Doug said angrily. Can you see anything at all? Red asked suddenly, leaning forward into the front seat. Yeah, I can see snow, Doug said, and laughed at his own stupid joke. We're never going to make it, I thought glumly. Then I scolded myself for being such a pessimist, but I can't help it. I'm basically a worrier. I can find something to worry about in any situation, and when I get in a really bad situation like this, I can find plenty to worry about. The car suddenly started to slide, really fast. I screamed and gripped the back of the front seat. Even through the hurling snow, I could see a sheer drop-off to the valley below on our right. And I could see that there were no guardrails along the side of the road. No! Shannon screamed too. Doug turned the wheel rapidly in the direction we were skidding. He pumped the brakes, but the car didn't slow. We're going over the edge, I thought. We're going to slide right over the side. I closed my eyes, but it didn't help. I could still feel the slide of the car, and then a sickening pull as we started to spin. Chapter 2 I couldn't breathe. I couldn't utter a sound. I opened my eyes. The car spun all the way around once, 
Then it stopped its front tires wedged in a snowdrift on the side of the road. Doug had a grin on his face. Like to see that again, he choked. Uh, Ariel, Red said softly. What? I had actually forgotten that Red was sitting there beside me. Uh, Ariel, do you think you could get your hand off my leg? I guessed. I was gripping Red's leg so tightly I must have been hurting him, and I hadn't even realized I was doing it. I jerked my hand away, feeling very embarrassed, feeling my face grow hot. I knew I was blushing bright red. Shannon and Doug laughed and turned around to look at us. You've got to watch Ariel. She's very aggressive, Shannon told Red, still laughing. Big laughs, at my expense. They were all feeling relieved that we were still alive, that we hadn't slid off the road and over the cliff. But we had very little reason to be relieved, as far as I was concerned. We still had a couple hundred miles to go, and the snow was coming down even harder now. Go back. Go back. That's what I imagined a howling wind to be saying. I've got a real imagination, especially when it comes to frightening myself. Doug backed the car onto the road. I closed my eyes as he did it. The back window was completely covered with snow. I knew he was backing up blindly. The car chugged, hesitated, chugged again, then started to move. All right, home, James, Doug cried happily. Can't you do anything about the heater? Shannon asked, shivering. It's blowing cold air. Try putting it on defrost, Red suggested, leaning forward into the front seat. It is on defrost, Doug said a little edgily. It's just busted, that's all. We're all busted, Red said, sounding glum for the first time since we'd met him. Well, turn it off then, Shannon said angrily, fumbling with the controls. Why do we need cold air blowing on us? It's already twenty below zero. Okay, fine. Doug impatiently pushed her hand away and slid the heater control to off. I could see that things were getting tense again up in the front seat, so I tried to change the subject. Did you know that snow has ten times the volume of rain? That means every inch of rain is equal to at least ten inches of snow. Scientific facts like that always distracted me from things that were bothering me, but of course I'm a science freak. My companions didn't seem to be terribly interested. Doug groaned loudly and started to tap out a rhythm on the dashboard with his right hand, steering with his left. Gee whiz, tell us another one, Mr. Wizard, Red said, laughing that funny high-pitched laugh he had. Hey, don't make fun of Ariel, Shannon said, coming to my defense. Someday, she's going to be a great doctor. If we live through this storm, I added to myself, feeling the car slide again, feeling that sense of dread run through my entire body. What's the scientific explanation for that feeling? I wondered. That creepy feeling you get when you're not sure just how frightened you should be. You start to feel heavy all over as if you're not going to be able to move, not going to be able to take another breath. A powerful gust of wind shook the car. Want me to drive for a while? Red asked again. You got a license, Doug asked. It sounded more like a challenge than a question. Yeah, sure, Red said calmly. I'm real good with cars. Well, maybe later, Doug said. I think we should turn back, I said, staring out at the falling snow. Huh? Doug reacted with disbelief. Have you lost it totally? We can, Shannon cried. If I don't get home tonight, I'll be grounded for the rest of my life. We've come too far to head back, Red said, turning to me. We've been driving over an hour. Even if we got back, they'd probably close the roads, and we could be stuck at the ski lodge for days. Good deal, Doug cried. I'll turn around. Just shut up and drive, Shannon said, shaking her head. Sorry, I said. Guess it was a bad idea. I wished we'd never left the lodge. I wish we'd never gone on this horrible ski weekend. Suddenly, the car sputtered and the tires slid again. We were all silent until Doug pulled it back under control. Then we went over a large bump. Oh, for some reason I pictured a body under the car. Some person lying stiff and frozen, half buried under the snow and ice. As I said, I'm real good at scaring myself. Just a bump, Doug said. Everyone laughed, high-pitched, nervous laughter. The road ran straight for a while and then started to curve again. I made a clear circle on my fogged-up window to peer out. I could see a deep, tree-filled ravine that dropped straight down from the edge of the road. If we started to slide, we'd plunge hood first into the ravine. The snow seemed to be blowing straight at the windshield as if attacking us. A violent burst of wind shook the car. We're almost to the bottom of the mountain, Doug said, squinting through the windshield. Maybe the snow won't be so bad once we reach the valley. Being home on Fear Street will be a pleasure after this, I said. This is really scary. The road straightened out again when we reached the valley but the snow was coming down just as hard as ever. 
We still hadn't seen another car either ahead of us or behind. Maybe the road was already closed and we didn't know it. There was no way to find out. Doug's car radio was broken too. I think I remember this area, Red said, energetically rubbing the steam off his window. Listen, Doug, there's a county road coming up in a little bit. Turn left off this road and take it. It'll head in the same direction eventually. Huh? Take a little county road? Get real, Red. Doug pushed a little harder on the gas. The car barely responded. No, listen. The county guys get the snowplows out a lot faster than the state highway guys. You'll see. The county roads are always cleared way before the state roads. Doug looked doubtful when he turned to see if Red was putting him on. But when we reached the intersection Red was talking about and the small green sign proclaimed County Road 6, Doug made a left onto it, the tires whirring in protest. The car nearly spun in a complete circle, but Doug managed to straighten it out one more time and we headed onto the county road. It's all woods and farms, I said glumly, staring out at the snow-covered pine trees. The world seemed to have gone black and white. The white of the snow was so bright, it was as if it blocked out all other colors. There's got to be a little town along this road, right? Shannon asked hopefully. She pulled off her hood and scratched her copper-colored hair. She shifted again in her seat. There's got to be a little town with a McDonald's, don't you think? Or one of those quaint little country restaurants? I'm so cold. I'm numb, Doug. I'm really numb. Maybe I'll stop the car and give you a massage, Doug said, giving her a devilish look. I'm serious, Shannon protested. I was still staring out the side window, freaking out on how all the color had disappeared from the world. When I looked back up to the front, I saw the truck bearing down on us. It was a huge red moving van. Despite the blowing snow, I could see it through the windshield. It suddenly felt as if everything were happening in slow motion. The truck sounded its horn, a deep blast, the sound muffled by the snow. It was coming right at us. The road was narrow, too narrow for us to pass each other. Doug slammed on the brakes, probably not the smartest thing to do. We started to slide right into the path of the truck. I closed my eyes. I heard the truck's horn again, this time much louder. The sound was deafening. It made my bones vibrate. I grabbed onto the back of Shannon's seat and prepared myself for the crash. Then I felt the roar of the truck as it rolled past us. It felt as if the car had been shoved away by the wind from the passing truck. All right, Doug yelled happily. We made it, I screamed, more surprised than anything else. We're going to be okay from now on, Doug declared, a big grin on his handsome face. The car went a few more yards, sputtered, stalled, and then died. Chapter 3 No one moved or talked, and then we all began talking at once. There's plenty of gas, Doug said, staring down at the gauge. So, we'll get it going again. Give it a try, Fred said, pushing his head between the seats to get a look at the dashboard dials. If it doesn't kick over, I'll get out and take a look under the hood. Like I said, I'm real good with cars. Hey, back off, man. I know what I'm doing, Doug snapped, glaring angrily at Red. Red slid back in his seat and raised his hands as if defending himself. Just trying to help out, boss. You can help out by shutting up, Doug said. Doug, chill out, Shannon said, giving his shoulder a hard shove. Don't take it out on Red. Doug was hot-headed, but he was acting more uptight than usual. Who could blame him? I'm never getting home. Never, Shannon cried. I reached forward and patted her shoulder, trying to get her to calm down. To my surprise, she was trembling all over. Doug turned the ignition key. There was a loud grinding noise. The engine coughed once, twice, and then turned over. The roar of it starting up was one of the nicest sounds I've ever heard. Maybe we should stop and put on extra sweaters and stuff, I suggested, thinking we all might feel better if we were dressed more warmly. I don't want to stop again, Doug said, staring straight ahead, still sounding angry. I'm afraid we might stall out again, and you wimps might really freak. Look at the temperature gauge, Red said, his boyish face locked in a serious frown. The engine is overheating. That's the problem. Thanks for the brilliant analysis, Mr. Goodrange, Doug said sarcastically to Red. Overheating? How can anything overheat in this cold? Shannon cried. We're not going to get much farther, Red announced glumly, ignoring Doug's hostility. There's got to be a town, Shannon insisted, sounding really frightened. They wouldn't build a road back here unless it went to a town, would they? The sky darkened. The snow continued to fall, gigantic flakes swirling in all directions, swept by the powerful winds. I could see nothing but tall pines, nothing but white-cloaked pines seeming to stretch forever. The car hesitated again. 
Doug pushed hard on the gas. I guess I was wrong about this road, Red said, staring out through his window, his hands cupped over his eyes to cut down the glare. It isn't any better than the state road. At least we're out of the mountains, I said, trying hard to look on the bright side. But we're nowhere, Shannon protested. Nowhere. Wait a minute, Red cried. His sudden excitement startled us all. There's a house up there in the woods. I think we should stop. Huh? But we've got to get home, Doug said. He braked the car just the same, but kept the engine idling fast. We're not going to make it in this car, Red said matter-of-factly, his eyes still searching the woods. We're going to stall out in the middle of nowhere. If we do, we really could freeze to death. I already have, Shannon said, reaching down the rubber ankles inside her boots. Red is right, I said. It's going to be dark very soon. I really don't want to be stranded out here on this deserted road with no heater, no food, no nothing. I turned to Red. Where's this house? Up there, he pointed. The trees went up a low hill. From where I was sitting, I couldn't see anything but snow and tree trunks. I was surprised that Red could see a house so far from the road. It's up on that hill. Looks like a ski lodge or something. It's really big, he said. Probably more than enough room to put us up for the night. And they'll have a phone, I said eagerly. We can call our parents. Let them know where we are. I'm doomed, Shannon said glumly. My life is over. What makes you think whoever's up there will take us in? Doug asked. More of a challenge to Red than a question. People are very hospitable in these parts, Red said. I told you, I grew up around here. I just remember when I was a kid how friendly everyone was. Not like city people. No one would turn us away in a storm like this. I guess it's worth a try, I said reluctantly. Yeah, let's go for it, Doug said, wiping the inside of the windshield with a balled up tissue. I could keep on driving. It's no sweat as far as I'm concerned. But I can see that you guys are whipped. Besides, this car has just about had it. For some reason, I thought of Randy. I hope you're enjoying your basketball game, safe and sound at home, I thought angrily. I vowed to myself that I'd never go out with him again. I hoped he was calling my house, wondering where I was, worrying about why I wasn't home yet, worrying along with my parents. I looked at my watch. It was 4.30. They wouldn't be worried yet. They wouldn't start to worry for another couple of hours. And by that time, I would have called and told them about the storm. Just pull the car over to the side of the road, Red told Doug. We'll leave all the ski stuff. Just take your overnight bags and we'll walk up the hill to the house. I guess the car will be safe here, Doug said, turning off the engine. Whatever you do, don't lock it, Red warned, opening his door and climbing out into the snow. The locks will freeze and you'll never be able to open the doors. He pulled on his blue wool ski cap and, staring up the hill, stretched his arms and legs. I couldn't wait to do the same. Even though it had been less than two hours, I felt as if we'd been trapped in the car for months. I climbed out and followed Red's gaze up the hill. Sure enough, there was a sprawling redwood house nestled among some pines. Smoke floated up from a stone chimney at the side. Way to go, Eagle Eye, I said, clapping Red on the back. He turned and grinned at me. He was really attractive when he smiled like that. I turned back to see Doug helping Shannon out of the car. He put one arm around her waist and pushed her car door shut with the other hand. I would kill for a cup of coffee, Shannon said, shivering. The snow clung to our hoods and hats and coats as we pulled our small overnight bags out of the trunk. The sky was really dark now. The wind seemed to grow colder even as we stood huddled at the back of the car. Wouldn't a nice hot bath feel good, I said to Shannon. Oh yes, Shannon exclaimed. Come on, let's get up to that house. Doug slammed the trunk shut. We started walking, the four of us in a straight line, up the low, sloping hill along a wide path through the trees. The snow was up to the top of our boots and in drifts it was even higher. It took a long time to get up the hill, but we were all so happy to be out of the car with a warm house in view that we didn't mind the snow, the cold, or the swirling winds. We were just a few yards from the front porch when the feeling of dread came back to me. I had a sudden shiver, not from the cold, a shiver of fear, but of course I ignored it. It was too late to turn back. Besides, it would be silly to give in to a momentary irrational feeling of panic. Right? 